Matthew Holt, another THTP Spotlight. I'm back with uh, Carolyn McGill. For, I, for, for a number of times, she's the CEO of Atrion, which is a real-world evidence analytics company, which means what, well, Carolyn? It means that we look at real-world data, which simply means any healthcare data collected in the normal, everyday course of our lives, so outside of a controlled setting, like claims, EHR, etc. We take these data and we run it through our platform to create regulatory grade evidence, real world evidence, that can be used to make important decisions about whether a secondary indication would be appropriate for a drug or whether a drug is safe, especially for patient populations who are explicitly excluded from clinical trials, like people over the age of 65 or kids under the age of 18 or people with multiple chronic illnesses. All right, so you obviously invented this carefully in your back garden. Uh, <laughs> where, where, where did the, uh, the data and the intelligence first come from? So about. we have three segments. The first segment is biopharma. The second relates to payers, and payers could be at-risk providers, could be health insurance companies, could be large employers. And then the third is about bringing all of those stakeholders together. So biopharma manufacturers tend to purchase data. The Payers themselves have their own. If I'm a large employer, if I'm a health insurance company, if I'm a government, as an example. And then when we bring them together, oftentimes it's for manufacturers and life sciences companies to analyze how their medications and devices are performing on specific patient populations that relate to the large employer or the at-risk provider or the health plan. Okay, so the algorithm intelligence behind this was created by whom and where? So our two founders are Harvard Medical School professors. Sebastian Schneeweiss is actually now the chairperson of pharmacoepidemiology and pharmacoeconomics up at Harvard Med. And then his partner in crime, for whom he'd actually been a dissertation advisor, is Dr. Jeremy Rassen, who is with us full time now. He's our president. They are experts in causality. So given a clinical intervention, what did it cause? What's the impact that specific clinical intervention had on the cost of care or on a clinical outcome? All right, so I started doing this work in the farm world way back in, uh, I think, 1993 in when I was Institute of the Future, and there was a, uh, a guy called Rob Mittman there who said, I'm gonna figure out for the people of pharma to explain to them, does their drug actually save money in the healthcare system? For about 25 years, they've always been paying lip service to this stuff, but you actually have done some work on this actual topic, and I described it as farmer's <coughs> dream the other day. But tell us about the study, the study you did with the Horizon. Yeah, absolutely. So we were thrilled about this. We have Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey came to us and asked for some support. We looked at their diabetes population, and we identified that there was a subset of the population that should be on a different class of drugs. And what was most interesting about this is that the new class of drugs was actually more expensive than the initial. And the conclusion was that this group of people would do better on this drug. Even though it was more expensive, it would bring down the total cost of care. It would give them better health outcomes. And so through this analysis, we were able to ensure that we're giving people with type 2 diabetes access to this medication or this, this cost of medication sooner. And of course, we were then able to connect them to the manufacturers of these drugs so that they can analyze the horizon data on our platform, figure out what kind of additional market access they might get, and then how does that then impact what they charge so that we can start to pay for outcomes. So that's pretty exciting and pretty novel stuff. I mean, yes. it's been talked about, as I said, forever. It's been really hard to imagine it actually getting, getting there. Um, Get, from that particular study on diabetes, give me a sense of what share of the diabetes population we're talking about who could benefit from the more expensive drug, and you know what kind of opportunity, what, what were kind of the total savings versus the kind of increased cost of the, of, of yeah, the drug? Yeah, you know, it was only it was almost um, I'd say probably it was ten percent of the population, yeah. and it's a five million dollar savings in the first year for and for Horizon. So yeah, for, yeah, for a, yeah. What's the basic medium sized blues plan? So can you extrapolate that across? Have you done the extrapolation if all Americans with diabetes? Yeah. Don't make me do math. All right, I'm just guessing. Okay, My okay. goodness, Matt. But we're really excited about the impact. And of course, why this is so interesting is that it keeps people away from unnecessary hospitalizations, yeah. ER visits. It improves the outcomes and the health of the population. So that's what's most exciting. Yeah, it's funny enough. I was on a, I was on a panel, actually. Uh, I was at a panel um, immediately after when I saw you on the, the other day. And then it was a similar conversation about primary care. Mm -hmm. Could we spend more in primary care? But we've had very little data and little understanding about how should we be spending our money yeah. effectively to prevent stuff later. And I've accepted that it's always been fun with great dreams to show that 
their drugs were worth all that money. Um, and we're talking probably about new and branded drugs as because it saved money elsewhere. And you know, it's been hard to prove. And, that's the real evidence that you all start yeah, to Yeah, and ultimately it's about the scientific rigor and having the credibility with the analytics so that we can be confident that yes, it was this clinical intervention that caused this specific result. Yeah. So that's where I'm going next, right? How do you keep Aeneon from being uh, regarded as the lap child of one of the other on these sites when you have when you have like somebody paying, somebody who's a manufacturer, um, a government, others with different uh, viewpoints? How do you keep yourselves to be that sort of Switzerland independent piece in the middle? We are indexing on transparency and science. And we believe that we can take the kind of science that comes from a randomized con controlled trial, as an example, and bring that to data studies. And by preparing a platform, delivering a platform that has the right level of transparency, where studies can be replicated, same assumption, same data set, it's crazy to think that they don't always come up with the same answers, but that's what happens when we write 10,000 lines of code and make right. all kinds of assumptions along the way. So our platform brings that transparency, the replicability, and we think that by ensuring we are dedicated to the science behind what we do and showing people the assumptions that we've made, these are the measures that we've applied and why we've applied them, that we can get different stakeholders together speaking a common language. Well, that's great because we don't have enough of that in healthcare. All right, a <laughs> couple more quick bits of news then. So uh, you just in a minute announced from McKesson about their iNomad platform, which yes. I remember way back when, when Dom Sigmo, Dom Sigmo uh, oh, uh, built it. Okay. <laughs> that was cool. Moment. But uh, tell me a bit about what that, that's going Yeah, about. so we're thrilled about that because, you know, the, the main thing about Ation is that we can accelerate time to regulatory grade insights. And so by bundling our platform with McKesson's data, we're able to ensure that our platform is ingesting the data very quickly so that the minute you decide to purchase ATOM, which of course you should, you can- I'm not sure what the everyday uses doing that, but let's you can, you can start using, uh, or start accessing, I should say, McKesson's data, and you can have the confidence that uh, the results that you get will be tied to the specific nuances of that data set. And so we're thrilled to be offering that now to our life sciences clients. Is that just an oncology for now, or is it going to go elsewhere? It will expand. So actually, our first iteration here is with researchers at Harvard Medical School of Brigham and Women's Hospital, and they're using it as part of the duplicate initiative and focused on oncology. Okay, fantastic. And then uh, you have another piece of news which is about to come out? Or will we be out by the time we show this? Uh, we do, actually. We also have a relationship with IBM, and it will be a similar, uh, it's a similar bundling of their data on our platform to accelerate time to insight. Is that that Watson thing we might be hearing a little bit about and all the different work they're doing? Somewhere in that, all right, yeah, very good. Yeah. Okay, well, what, are, what else can we expect from you guys in the next, in the near enough future? Well, so there's all kinds of fun things that we are doing with both our life sciences and our payer clients as it relates to integrating into their enterprise-wide solutions for things that require science. So creating a cohort of patients as an example, or creating measures that are appropriate for uh, non-smell cell lung cancer, which are different than measures that might be appropriate for breast cancer or for immunology or for cardiometabolic conditions. And those are the kinds of things that we think will help us accelerate time to insight in a scientifically credible way. Fantastic. All right, let me ask you two more, two final things to close. Um, so, Adion, I, I'm getting lost in numbers. You raised 58 million, how much now? So, so you, you remember? Yeah, our, so we've raised about seventy-five, 75 million total right. across all of our all of and, our rounds. And give yeah. me give me a sense of how, how many people you are, how fast you can bring number of people, how fast you can bring number of clients. How 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 is the rocket ship doing? It will to, it's to the moon, the sky, to where? the moon. Yeah, absolutely. We're thrilled with our growth, especially since <coughs> we see our existing clients coming back yeah. and asking us to do more things for them. Well, that's so that's. Put, a, put it on the engine and getting in the prize probably helps yeah, with that. Exactly. So how, we're how many people are you? Doing? We're approaching 150 people, and uh, we have a very, very healthy growth rate that keeps how many, Bill Geary how many, how many, and, and Momoksumi yeah, happy good, from good, Flair and good, NEA, good. so we're thrilled about that. So how many clients? Uh, oh, geez, so many. It's hard to count. <laughs> I don't have I don't have the number off the top of my head, but it's a healthy number both within the biopharma manufacturer community and it's different segments. Yep. So we first started with larger and now we're getting into mid, which is super yep. exciting, the kinds of partnerships we can have there. And then on the payer side, it's not just large national, it's also regional. So it's fun to see that mix as well. All right. 
Last question, not related to ATL, but related yeah, to you. Um, apart from the very important you know, skiing news, uh, you're one of not a huge number of female CEOs in this space, and I know that's a topic near and dear to your heart. It so is. so uh, pontificate about it. How do we, how do we make more calories? Well, so we believe in supporting people and giving women in particular an opportunity to be empowered, to take on new challenges, and holding them accountable, right? But giving them the freedom to experience both of those things. And then listening to them, giving them a voice, giving them an opportunity to contribute in significant settings. And we think that these kinds of things can help them as they progress in their careers. So how are you doing that internally and externally? So internally, we have a group called Women at ATL where we facilitate dialogue with external people, with internal people, about some of the things that we as women are experiencing and how we can support one another. Another thing that I try to do internally relates to demonstrating the behaviors that we want others to emulate. So when I notice someone, sometimes a man, repeating something a woman has just said. I can't imagine that would ever happen. Pointing it out. I might point it out. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> okay, or, or when you point it out, Matt, it's remarkable. <laughs> or when we're in a meeting and I notice that um, you know maybe a woman is trying to speak and hasn't been able to do it yet. So just turning and saying, "Hey, what what do you think so about you're this?" Using your power as the CEO to actually absolutely, do that. So that's great. absolutely. And then externally, again facilitating dialogue. I'm on the board of an organization called Parity, and we support organizations in taking a pledge, just a pledge to say that as they hire senior executives, including board members, into their organization, they will include at least one woman in their candidate slate. So, so simple, and yet oftentimes it's something that's overlooked. Well, great stuff, uh, great great innovations, great uh, messages, and uh, you know, holding people's feet to the fire, so I love it. All right, Ms. Rina Carolyn McGill, she is the uh, CEO of Asia. What? Oh, hang on, the one, just one more thing. Tell us about your jewelry. <laughs> Hand up the camera, come on. <laughs> um, I wonder why you. she was kicking me. <laughs> <laughs> you said you would ask, we were talking about it before, and you said you were going to ask about it. So this is um, a bracelet that was made by um, my dear friend's daughter. She has twins. And what's fun about my, my friend, she's a friend from college, we played rugby together, and she passed away this summer from breast cancer. And when I was visiting her husband and her twins, her twin, uh, one of them gave me this bracelet and she said, you know, I actually made this for myself, but I want you to have it. Because they live in Oakland, I live in uh, New York City, and so it was just a nice way to remember her and uh, I love it. I think it's the perfect compliment to every outfit. Well, I'm so sorry to hear about your friend, but it's beautiful to have peace with her with you. Yes. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you. It's always fun.